podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I am uh, I'm battling something, some kind of sickness, illness. I think my son gave it to me. They're just like walking germ balls. You know what I mean? They're just, just, I don't know. And then my mom told me, oh, then you shouldn't kiss him. What do you mean I shouldn't kiss my son? I think it's crazy. Anyways, I digress. So uh, I might sound a little off. I'm trying to bring the energy up here. Today, we got a treat for you. This is a special episode. Here's why. We are bringing on a guest for the second time. Our guest this week is Roman Kurznarik. He was also featured on episode 90 all the way back in May of 2013. And we talked about his book, How to Find Fulfilling Work. I actually reached out to Roman about a year ago to record this episode. So it is old. And here's why it is old. This was going to be the lead interview in my new podcast, which was then called Thrive. Now, I I still plan on doing it. I'll give you the working title just because you guys, you know, you're part of the family. It's going to be called Work Happier. That's it. Um, So I've been trying to release this podcast and just thing after thing after baby after house after job keeps popping up. Great opportunities, great things. I'm not complaining. So what I decided to do was instead give it to the listeners of Smart People Podcast. It's too good to not be out in the world. I shouldn't have hung on to it for this long anyways. But we're going to be talking to Roman about what was at the time his uh, brand new book. Now it's about a year old. And it's called How Should We Live? Great Ideas from the Past for Everyday Life. Roman's just one of those guys. He's one of those guys I connected with because his mission is very similar to mine. You know, he's all about getting the most out of life, integrating what you do with what you enjoy, uh, the human side of things. And I just, for some reason recently, have felt like I'm losing a little bit of that. You know, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's I'm traveling like crazy. Um, I'm doing some great stuff. I'm speaking a lot. Uh, I'm doing training seminars, but I'm on planes and hotels, and I don't know. I I just haven't been able to focus as much. And so, anyways, it was really great to to go back and listen to this and say, I'm going to share it with you guys. So just to bring you up to speed, Roman is a cultural thinker, writer, and founding faculty member of the School of Life in London. He's taught sociology and politics at Cambridge University and City University London, And he advises organizations, including Oxfam and the UN, on using empathy and conversation to create social change. He's been named by The Observer as one of Britain's leading lifestyle philosophers. Like I said, great guy. Excited to bring this episode to you. Let us know what you think. He is at Roman Kersnarik on Twitter. Yeah, try to spell that. It's Roman, R-O-M-A-N, Kersnarik, K-R-Z-N-A-R-I-C. And we are at Smart People Pod. Love to hear from you. Please feel free to check us out at smartpeoplepodcast.com. And don't forget, if you're using Amazon, smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Thank you guys so much. Here it is, an oldie but a goodie with our friend Roman Kersnarik. What path did you take to kind of, I mean, you're very successful. You've, you, you're cranking out books. They're all fantastic. I've read a number of them already and, and this newest one. What was your path and, and what would you recommend to those that kind of, you know, see that, want to be creating content, want to be giving back in terms of what they've learned? Well, when I went to college, of course, you couldn't, that was 20 years ago, you couldn't do a course in the art of living or how to become a philosopher of life or anything like that. I had to really find my own way through conducting a lot of experiments. I was originally actually uh, an academic, a university professor, a college professor teaching sociology and politics, but I found it terribly boring and bureaucratic. And I left that to 
help uh, run an organization in England, in Oxford, called the Oxford Muse, spelled M-U-S-E, which was invented to try and create conversations between strangers, to try and sit down CEOs with homeless people to talk about what really mattered in life and work and love and death and this kind of thing. And then from that, I started teaching my own classes in the art of living. And I started teaching them in my own kitchen because I couldn't find anywhere to do them. <laughs> I took classes on the different varieties of love, workshops on finding fulfilling work and rethinking time. And eventually they left my kitchen and I started doing them in public places. And then I later helped found an organization called the School of Life. Uh, in London with a philosopher called Alain de Botton and some other writers and artists. And the idea of the School of Life was it should be a place where you can go and learn everything you can't learn in college about life, about thinking about your creative self, about how to make a difference in society, about how to think about love and death and all these aspects of life. And that School of Life is now spread to Brazil, to uh, Australia. We're going to be opening in the United States in 2014. So that's been my rough path and through having made lots of mistakes along the way. I was just caught up on the fact that you're opening the School of Life here in the U.S. and was like, light bulb, where, where are you opening that? At the moment, it looks like we're going to be opening first in San Francisco mm -hmm. and then probably opening in some other places as well. There's been a huge demand in the U.S. for the School of Life experience. At the moment, a lot of people come from the States to come and do our courses, intensive one-week courses, or they do a variety of other workshops and things. And I think it's about time that we spread our wings and went to North America because I've just actually recently been in Brazil where there was a huge appetite for people thinking about and rethinking their lives. And I think we're at a moment in history, really, where more and more people are doing this, partly because there's been, I think, the failure of material and consumer culture to really deliver human happiness. We're also falling in love and finding in friendships in new ways because of digital technology and social networks. Everything's really in flux. Everything is changing. We need to be rethinking how to live today. Since you have seen all these different people come to the School of Life and from all over the world, do you notice differences in cultures? At first glance, say if I'm teaching a class at the School of Life in London, you have people from different countries and it, immediately at first they seem to be rather different from each other. For example, some people, for example, from Latin American cultures are more open about talking about their emotions and maybe some people from Norway or England seem a little bit more closed. But actually, once you create a space where people can talk openly and feel free to express themselves, what you find is this great kind of universal desires which cut across cultures. Everybody's looking for more fulfillment in work. Everybody, or well, most people seem to be, you know, dissatisfied with high stress lifestyles in the modern world and are trying to do something different. Obviously, you find some distinctions between them, but what is most striking is this universal appeal. I mean, for example, even people from South Korea who come to the School of Life seem to be having the same dilemmas of someone who comes from London or from New York. And it's really quite amazing. When you mentioned the, the high stress, and that's one of the things that caught me off guard when I came into the workforce. And I was thinking, I just read this article. It was written a while ago by a guy kind of projecting into the future. And he said by, you know, 21st century, the biggest problem they'll have is trying to find what to do with their free time because technology will have satisfied all of the requirements of daily life. And clearly, and then the report goes on to show it's been the exact opposite. I mean, we have all this technology, yet we're working harder, longer, stressed out. But what is the reasoning for that? I mean, can we say that at least we are better off? As, as a whole, we have created better systems and we're just continually trying to do so? Or have we really lost touch with what it means to be human and now we're just focused on creating and making more and having more? Well, interestingly, that idea that our great dilemma in the future would be how, how to deal with our leisure time actually goes back to the early 1930s um, to a British economist called John Maynard Keynes. And I actually discussed this in my book, How Should We Live? And Keynes thought that economic progress had been so uh, extreme, was going so fast that we would satisfy all our material desires and we'd, our great dilemma would be exactly, or our dilemma for our grandchildren, he famously said, was how to spend all this leisure time. Now, Keynes was, as you suggest there, totally wrong. All these people who predicted that we'd have all this free time were incorrect. The question is why. There is a very simple reason why. 
is that none of them expected us to be ratcheting up our consumer desires throughout the 20th century. They thought most people had actually, in the Western world, met their material needs for housing and, and food and health care, and they'd have, be able to spend the rest of their time you know, pursuing artistic and scientific endeavors. So when you think of, okay, what's gone wrong here? It's what psychologists call the hedonic treadmill, which is the idea that we think that the way to live the good life is to enjoy consumer and material culture and material uh, products and services. So we work harder and harder and harder to buy ourselves uh, a bigger or faster car or a wider widescreen TV or a second holiday home. Um, and we get that thing. And what happens is our happiness immediately spikes up and then it drops back down to its earlier levels because we get used to things. And then our expectations go up even higher and we work harder and harder and harder to gain more and more and more. And we get caught on this what the psychologists call, as I said, a, a hedonic treadmill, a kind of a, a never-ending spiral or treadmill of pleasures. And our great task today is really to try and get off that treadmill. So I think if people from the past looked at how we are today and they asked, look, are today's people better off? I'm not sure they'd think so because we're working harder and harder. I mean, working hours dropped throughout most of the 20th century, but in the last 20 years, they've started going up again. Famously, in 1998, working hours in the United States started going past the number of working hours in Japan, and it's only been getting worse. So I think where we are today is at a place where we need to learn to wean ourselves off this high-stress, high-work culture. And in a way, what I think we can do is look to past traditions, start thinking even about history and how that can teach us about rethinking uh, how we live now. Well, I actually got goosebumps when you said that, especially the part about history. And that's that's a perfect segue into your newest book, How Should We Live? Great Ideas from the Past for Everyday Life. It was so refreshing to see this because I, again, I, I really believe that most of our problems are human problems. There are some that are 21st century problems, but at their core, they're human problems that we've been dealing with for thousands of years. And so you just realized that and then magically walked through history. I kind of think it's a Cliff's Notes version. You took a Cliff's Notes of the, the best people in history and then you dove into everything they did and walked us through some things. How did you come up with this idea? And then how was the process? Because it, it seemed like it had to be really intense. It was really interesting. Basically, the, the way I wrote this book was through going on a rather unusual journey a few years ago. And it was a journey through the world's bookshops. And whenever I walk through bookshops down those long aisles of self-help and personal development books, what I noticed about them was that almost the, all the ideas in the books I saw were based on thinking from psychology or from philosophy or from religious and spiritual thought. But there was almost nothing from history. And that struck me as a great tragedy. It seemed obvious to me that surely, as you say, people have been dealing with dilemmas of how to make their love lives work or think about death or find fulfilling work. They've been doing this for thousands of years. So the idea I had was let's really mine into history. Let's try and borrow the best thinking from the past, from other civilizations and cultures, and try and apply them to our dilemmas about life today. And I was very much inspired by a quote from the 18th century German writer Goethe, who said that he who cannot draw on 3,000 years is living from hand to mouth. And I really believe that going right back to the ancient Greeks 3,000 years ago, there are fantastic ideas that we can put to work today. And it was a very intense thing doing the research into these various areas of life because I started with love and family relationships and I ended up also writing about creativity and travel and our attitudes to nature. I was trying to think of the big areas of life that were relevant to people from many different countries and cultures. How did you go about finding these influential historical figures or cultures that touched on each thing? I was very lucky in that for the previous 10 years, I'd been absolutely obsessed with historical figures who I'd found inspiring, whether that was Henry David Thoreau, the great 19th century naturalist, or Socrates in ancient Greece, um, or Leonardo da Vinci in the Renaissance. So I've been spending, <laughs> excuse me, years reading about these figures and trying to pluck out really the lessons from their lives that we could apply to how we're thinking about everyday life today. So in writing the book, 
I really used my own knowledge, but also spoke to historians and cultural thinkers, anthropologists from many realms of life to try and see what who were the most inspiring figures. And really, my method was to cherry pick the best stuff. You know, I wasn't interested in ideas from the past which didn't seem really relevant to us today. I mean, you can read all about divorce, you know, marriage practices in Mongolia in the 17th century, but I wasn't sure that those <laughs> ideas were very relevant today. But the ideas about love from ancient Greek, where they had Greece, where they had six different kinds of love, very different from our obsession with romantic love today, those seem to be absolutely relevant to um, our thinking about relationships now. So really it was a process, a long process of, of cherry picking and then also testing out which were the best ideas by giving talks and seminars and lectures, public workshops around Britain and some other countries and seeing, well, what was really inspiring people. Now let's take a break for a message from one of our favorite sponsors, The Great Courses. Have you checked them out yet? Because if not, you're missing out. Like so many of you, our love of learning obviously didn't stop when we finished school. In fact, it's amazing that I cared less in school, but that's besides the point. But we're so excited about the Great Courses Plus video learning service because you get unlimited access to thousands of the Great Courses online lectures on so many topics taught by top professors, the same professors that you might have tuned out 5, 10, 20 years ago. We really want you to try the Great Courses Plus. So they are giving our listeners a special chance to watch hundreds of their courses for free, including the course that we just watched, which is Fundamentals of Photography, which is taught by professional photographer and National Geographic fellow Joel Sartor. In it, he gives you tools and techniques to take better pictures, advice on lighting, framing. It's actually kind of fascinating and you can get it, you know, fairly quickly at your own pace. So we're big fans of The Great Courses Plus, and we want you to try it too. As one of our listeners, when you sign up, you will immediately get one month free to start any lectures you want. Start your free trial today by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash smart people. Okay, now let's break this down. It's thegreatcoursesplus, gotta have the plus there, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash smart people. It's the only way to get that free month. Go check it out. Back to our show. Given that a lot of this this show focuses around work, I don't want to just touch on work, given how much great insight you have in this book. But that was the first place I went to. And so I, was, I wanted to dive in. And the first thing that caught me was even in the at, at the beginning of the book, in the preface, you say, the demise of the job for life and rising expectations of finding work that broadens our horizons as well as pays the bills has increased our confusion about choosing the right career. And that was a summation of exactly how I have felt for a decade and, and what I've tried to move past. So I kind of wanted to dive right into that section first and see, you know, what was your greatest insight on what history has to tell us about work? And then we can kind of niche down a little. Yeah, I think, of course, if you look at work today, job dissatisfaction levels are at record heights. In the United States, 45% of people are dissatisfied with their work. It's even higher in Europe. More and more people are feeling that they're looking for meaning. They want to not just pay the bills, but find purpose through their work. And it's fascinating. When you look back through history, on the one hand, you see a certain pattern, which is that for most of history, People have not had choices about their work. They haven't felt confused about what they wanted to do because they never thought that they could find much meaning in it. Work was seen as a, as, as a drudgery in a way, as Mark Twain famously said that he said, work is a necessary evil to be avoided. And that, I think, was the picture for most of history, where I think work was seen as a matter of fate and necessity. It wasn't something where you could really take opportunities. But what I discovered was that over the last hundred or so years is that the, the amount of opportunities have been expanding, but that we can look back to particular figures in history who found ways of making work meaningful. I mean, one of the most famous was Leonardo da Vinci in the Renaissance, who embodied the idea of what I just think of as the wide achiever, which is in contrast to our modern idea of being a high achiever, the idea that the best way to use your talents is w at work is to become a specialist in a narrow field. Well, that idea has been around for about 100 years. But if you go back to the Renaissance, 
the most common way or the ideal way to be a human being was to nurture the many sides of your personality to achieve wide rather than high. For Leonardo da Vinci, it was about doing several jobs at the same time and maybe on a freelance basis. So in any one week, he was you know, doing some portrait for an artistic patron, then developing some engineering devices for a power-hungry Milanese duke, and then doing anatomy experiments on the side. And that idea of achieving widely over many fields, I think, is something that's very attractive today, where many people feel that, you know, I'm not just one person. Just becoming a specialist isn't enough for me. I have many sides of who I am. I want to have a portfolio of careers. So let's go back to the Renaissance, I think, and um, steal that idea, really, and apply it today. And, you know, one thing that is making that possible is technology, obviously. It's amazing how we go to get episodes transcribed and we can go on Elance or we want a design done and we'll go on 99designs or anything. People from all over the world can bid on doing work and get solid work. And it's really cool um, to see how we're perhaps getting to that, as you mentioned, the Renaissance way of, of work. Yeah, I think that certainly digital technologies, homeworking... Um, more flexible working practice has been opening the possibilities and everybody can become a filmmaker or a radio producer and and this kind of thing and it's really quite remarkable the tragedy is that a lot of modern businesses are try starting to uh in a way look backwards um yahoo famously earlier this year uh, the new ceo of yahoo told all her workers that they were no longer allowed to work at home and they all had to work back in uh, back in the office and i think that is quite a backward step often people are more productive in the home uh, or when they're working choosing where they work and how they work so i think that we need to keep looking to technology uh, as a possibility for helping us rethink how we go about our working lives and, and grasp those opportunities. I'm a huge fan of working on a bunch of different things. I have probably six projects, four of which I'm working on today alone. So it's kind of crazy. But, you know, I often worry I'm not going to become an expert in anything. And therefore, the, the real, and I don't want to tie this to money, but everything is, the real money or the security, if you will, which I attach to money, comes from being an expert in something. I mean, if you've been doing something for 20 years, you're going to get paid more than the guy that's been doing it for five or on the side. What, what did you discover or what are your thoughts on that? What's really remarkable is that People who give up being the expert in the narrow field and try to be wide achievers, you know, like you doing several different things, when they leave those full-time, you know, professional careers and go maybe freelance working for themselves, what's absolutely remarkable is that even where if their incomes have dropped a bit or they've lost security, sense of security, they almost never go back to that old nine-to-five <laughs> expert job. You know, once they've tasted a bit of autonomy or freedom, they almost never want to reverse back to their earlier life. So it's certainly true that there are costs to you know, doing three or four different things at the same time because uh, exactly that, you, you have less security often. But I wonder actually if the security one has as, as an expert really is as much as we think it is. You might be your... Be, have, have a particular expertise, but nobody is immune to being downsized or outsourced anymore. Nobody really has security. So I actually think it's a smart move is to do several jobs at the same time because you're spreading the risk, particularly in a recession-led or uneven job market. It's actually quite uh, a clever thing to do. Certainly, there is this feeling that, oh, my God, I'm never going to be good at anything if I do everything or several different <laughs> things at the same time. You'll be a jack of all trades and a master of none. But one of the reasons I invented the term a wide achiever was to try and give that idea of being a jack of all trades a more positive spin because companies are increasingly looking for people who have multidisciplinary thinking, who can think across boundaries. I mean, one of the most famous examples of this it was back in the 1930s in London. There was a, uh, an engineer working on the metro, the underground in, in London, a guy called Harry Beck. He was just an engineering guy and uh, he took a look at the, um, the map of where all the stations are, uh, the, the, the transport map for where all the different metro or underground stations were, subway stations were in London. And the map was a complete mess of spaghetti. And what he did was he used his engineering mind to redesign the subway map to look like a, an ele electricity circuit board, a very simplified version. And that map, anybody who goes to London today, is still there now. And what really was going on was that an engineer was using his brain and applying it to the world of graphic design. 
It's an iconic piece of graphic design, the London tube map done by Harry, Harry Beck. And that kind of interdisciplinary thinking, I think, is exactly what you get from being a wide achiever. Yes, you may not be a corporate tax accountant expert or a, you know, a surgeon specializing in the middle ear, but um, you've got something that a lot of people lack, which is the creativity to jump between different ways of looking at the world, which you get from your interdisciplinary thinking. Incredible. I mean, it really is incredible. When I was working in commercial real estate, and this was back seven, eight years ago, we started our program where we were outsourcing a lot of the analytical work to India. And when I spoke to somebody, uh, you know, I said, look, I don't think they're doing as good of a job in all this, expecting him to want to look into the efficiencies. And to their credit, they said, OK, that might be slightly true, but we're also providing jobs for people that need it. So there, there are a number of reasons why things are getting outsourced or jobs are changing hands. And I love the idea of kind of building your foundation wide and pursuing the things that pay the bills, but also feed your soul. I also wanted to to say that one of the things that came out of your book that is interesting, I think we touched on last time we talked, is history only emphasizes why career choice today is so difficult. It's a modern dilemma almost. Is that true or is that just something I kind of pulled out on my own? You're absolutely right that career choice is a modern dilemma, that sense of confusion about the options. I mean, go back to the 18th century and there were only about 30 standard jobs that you know, you could do. You could be a barrel maker or a, or a printer's apprentice like Benjamin Franklin. Um, but today, of course, we know we can all go to websites that have got 12,000 different jobs uh, listed on them, and we're all left in a state of confusion or uh, a state of paralysis. So the real question is, how do you find your way through the confusion? And if you look back into great thinkers in the past, you can find really smart ideas about how to do this. The great uh, 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche famously said that he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. And what he meant there was that if you can find something that gives you meaning or purpose in life, then even if it isn't always making you happy all the time, you know, say a particular job, it doesn't really matter because you're give, doing something that gives you a sense of, of value or a sense of meaning. And this idea was picked up by the Austrian uh, psychoanalyst Viktor Frankl, who was an Auschwitz survivor who discovered something really important after his experiences in Auschwitz and the other death camps during the Second World War. He discovered that the people who were most likely to survive weren't the big brawny types who were good at scavenging food, but were actually the people who had a sense of meaning or purpose, something they look forward to that they wanted to do. So, for example, there was a, a scientist who was in the middle of writing a chemistry textbook when he was captured, and the thought of actually that he was the only person who could complete writing this textbook kept him going, according to Frankel, and he, it kept him going all the way through the war and through the death camps, and he came out the other end. And I think what Frankel discovered was that what we need to do is to try and discover a meaningful purpose in life which keeps us going through good and bad times. The trick, of course, is that that purpose, for example, that career, isn't something that normally comes to you in just a flash of inspiration, a vocation that you pluck out of the air like some miraculous religious vision. It actually comes through being experimental, through dry, trying out different things. Just like the painter Vincent van Gogh wasn't originally a painter. He hadn't decided to do that at the age of seven. You know, he had worked as an art dealer, a bookseller, uh, an elementary school teacher, an evangelical preacher in the Belgian coal mines, earning in his late 20s did he discover painting. So I think being an, exp an experimenter has always been, throughout history, one of the keys to the good life. This week's episode is sponsored by Igloo. Work is no longer a location. Teams can be together half a world away. Igloo is a modern intranet designed to keep everyone on the same page. With Igloo, you can share files, have real conversations in real time, and do it all while being able to use the apps you currently use, like Box, Google Drive, and Skype. Igloo brings everything together and creates a single destination that lets you focus on your work. Put simply, Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. Try it today at igloosoftware.com slash smart. That's igloosoftware.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. 
You know, I, I had that written down in my notes that I wanted to talk to you about, the, the story you just told about Vincent Van Gogh, because oftentimes people assume that these historical figures that have just reached the pinnacle, that they were always that person. To see somebody like Vincent Van Gogh, who everybody knows and knows his talents, realize, he didn't realize them or even really start dedicating himself to them till I guess you said, late 20s. I mean, that's a, that's a good thing to know, and it's a good lesson to take from history. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's interesting to mention people like Mozart or perhaps another person like Michelangelo, who, you know, was a a great artist from an early age, just like Mozart was a great musician. Now, one of the things I talk about in, in, in the book, How Should We Live, is actually the history of creativity. And if you look back at the history of creativity, what you see is that we've been burdened today by a terrible inheritance, really, which is this idea that if you're going to be good at anything, you have to have been born with some great skill, like a God-given skill. You know, Michelangelo famously talked about how his artistic abilities were, you know, a a divine gift. And, And Mozart, too, when he talked about where his musical abilities came from, he said, look, I don't really know. They just sort of come out from me. And this has created, a, I think, a terrible myth that the idea that creativity is something only that you're born with. But if you look at modern research into creativity and the psychology of creativity, we discovered that actually you can learn to be good at things. You can learn to be creative. I mean, about 10 years ago, a famous piece of research showed that with 10,000 hours of practice, you can get more or less good at most things. You've got to put in those hours, but you don't necessarily have to be uh, granted a divine uh, creative gift to become a good violinist necessarily. But if you put in the hours, that's what really makes the difference. And studies have been done of basketball stars, musicians, doctors, all sorts of innovators. And it's actually putting in a lot of those long, hard hours that can actually create the possibilities for us. So I think that people like Michelangelo and Mozart have left a a terrible taste in our mouths that we need to try and get rid of by um, sipping on a different bit of uh, historical knowledge. So I was wondering what you saw in terms of trends uh, in creativity throughout history. The thing that I was most struck by is the way that human beings uh, all have a kind of creative drive within them. You know, today we might spend most of our time staring at a computer screen, but human beings have always been inventors. I mean, if you look at the history of craft work, we've always made things with our hands, whether it's weaving 20,000 years ago um, or making implements. And if you look at history, we haven't just made things that are functional, but also things that are beautiful. Think of the great 19th century craftsperson, William Morris, who was a poet and a, uh, a tapestry maker and a furniture designer and, and many other things as well. He embodied the idea of what's known as homo faber. That's the idea of man as a, a tool-making animal. And we are, in a way, tool makers. We like making things. We don't just want to be stuck in front of a computer screen or reading all day. We actually want to be doing stuff with our hands and creating new things. The problem is that that creative craft impulse has been hammered out of us, I think, by modern society. You know, not many people um, actually get to use their hands very much in their work. I recently made a chair. I love furniture making. And the great thing about chair making was that is that you can do a task from beginning to end. You know, I chopped down the tree, I stripped the bark, I I honed the, the legs of the of the chair and I put it together and, and put beeswax on at the end. And wow. very, very seldom do we do a whole task from beginning to end. We just do a tiny part of it, a narrow strip, a bit like that idea of a specialist, which I mentioned earlier. And actually, a craft person does the many sides. And I think the more we can do all those different parts of a process, I think the more creative and craft-like we'll feel. I I was just thinking, when I think of making something, because my my dad does a lot of that woodworking, and he's really good. He built a lot of stuff growing up, but never chopped down the tree and took the bark off. So that is an impressive uh, feat, I must say. I don't do it every day, but it's something I aspire to do more often. But, you know, you can do these creative tasks every single day when you get home from work, which is, you know, when you're cooking, you can um, inject a little bit of creativity. Even if you're taking a frozen pizza out of the uh, out of the freezer, you can put on the ingredients to make it look like a Jackson Pollock drip painting, if you like. <laughs> you know, really, it's those small moments of daily creativity which actually keep us alive. 
And you can do it as work at work as well. When you're designing a PowerPoint presentation, you can make it look like a work of art. You can put as little sort of ink on the page as it were. You can do a beautiful minimalist design. And these things give us tiny but profound daily pleasures, which I think make us feel more alive as human beings. It's a perfect example, actually. I recently discovered in, in the job I have now, I, I work for a nonprofit and I do a lot of the marketing and, and sales and advertising. The time actually passes more quickly, which goes back to the idea of flow, which I'm a huge proponent of. It passes more quickly when I'm building PowerPoints, putting together different images, using our graphics, working on our website. And I just realized, man, this was a, a, a thing I never knew I liked until given the opportunity opportunity and it does it makes the entire day whether it be 30 minutes or an hour it makes the entire day better that's right and i think that idea of flow is really important the idea of being absolutely immersed in the moment in a way we need to become detectives of our own flow experience to really discover what is it that makes us forget all time that's passing and that you you're really just totally so immersed in something that you don't even realize that you're you're doing it and that time is passing um and what you find amongst a lot of, for example, social entrepreneurs, people are starting their own businesses and so on, uh, whether it's non-profit, for-profit, etc., is that they're often having to do lots of different tasks from the marketing to designing websites, liaising with clients and so on. And it's actually they get a kick out of doing all these different things. And what it's actually telling us and what you're really telling me is that being a wide achiever comes naturally to you. You know, we've all got a little bit of Leonardo da Vinci in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it took a while to learn that. And I encourage everybody to really, as Roman just mentioned, you know, next time time flies for you, think about what it is that you are doing and how you can incorporate that in your lives and in your work. And let me know. I mean, report back. I, I love hearing about this stuff. The next thing I want to go into in your book, what character of history most surprised you? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> Let me think. Who is the character in history that most surprised me? You know who I think it was? I think it was the 19th century novelist Leo Tolstoy, who most people think of as the great you know, writer of books like War and Peace and Anna Karenina. Exactly. But, yeah. but when I looked into his life, I discovered that the thing that he was really good at was not just writing, but the idea of closing the gap between what he believed and how he acted in the world. And when I've looked through history, I've discovered that this is one of the great challenges in life. You might have certain beliefs and ethics and values and so on, but how much do you really live them out in your everyday life? You might say to yourself, right, I really want to make a difference, but are you really putting that into practice? And Tolstoy was incredible. He underwent a series of changes throughout his life. He changed his beliefs. For example, he was from an aristocratic Russian background. He was a count, as you probably know. He was inherited hundreds of serfs and a great big estate. Now, he was originally a soldier, fought in the Crimean War in the 1950s, but 1850s, but that experience of being a soldier turned him into a pacifist when he saw the suffering of war. Equally, when he once heard, uh, he saw somebody being guillotined, their head being chopped off in Paris, when he heard the head thump into the box below, it gave him such a shock and shudder that he immediately became an opponent of big authoritarian state power and became something of a, a kind of a, a libertarian anarchist or, or radical thinker. Equally, he was a believer in the Russian Orthodox Church, but then became uh, dissatisfied with the privileges of the church and became a radical Christian ascetic, and he set up all these communes. And then he tried to give up on his very privileged, wealthy lifestyle. He was a great believer in equality between all people, even though he was an aristocrat. He started dressing in midlife as a, as a Russian peasant and spending most of his time with the peasants rather than with the Russian literati in Moscow and, and so on. He even, and this is amazing, while he was in the middle of writing his great novel, Anna Karenina, he stopped in the middle for a couple of years and went off to do famine relief work because there was a great famine in Russia. And all his friends were saying, how can you stop you know, writing your great novel? You're, you're you know, Europe's greatest novelist. And he said, look, I'm just writing about characters in a book. You know, it's actually people suffering that's much more important. So I think Tolstoy was someone who was always trying to close the gap between what he believed how he acted. But like all of us, and this is what I also like about him, he was full of contradictions. You know, he was a preacher about equality, but he would never gave up having servants in his own home. Uh, he was a great preacher about universal love, but he could never stop fighting with his wife. 
And I think that is realistic, that we're all engaged with the struggle. None of us are perfect, but at least we can try and be true to ourselves. And that's what you cover in this book, How Should We Live? And and there's much more to it. I mean, as you mentioned, you touch on love and relationships and money and you know death. It's, it's really a fantastic breakdown of history. I encourage everyone to, to check it out. Where else can our listeners kind of learn about you? I mean, I really want them to be able to read what you're doing as I know it vibes with the community that, that we've created. Well, of course, people can go and have a look at my website, which is www.romankrasnarik.com. That's R-O-M-A-N-K-R-Z-N-A-R-I-C. Or follow me at on Twitter at Roman Krasnarik. Um, subscribe to my blog, which is called Outrospection, the opposite of introspection. And there you'll find stuff about my books and videos and media articles and all kinds of stuff. So I invite everybody to um, have a look, at, have a look, have a read of the book, How Should We Live? And um, send me your thoughts about the art of living. All right, Roman. Thanks so much. Have a great day. And to you. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Roman Krasnarik. You can find his book, How Should We Live? Great Ideas from the Past for Everyday Life at Amazon or at your local bookstore. If you decide to purchase it through Amazon, don't forget to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Shopping at Amazon through our link comes to no cost to you but gives us a nice little kickback from Amazon that helps keep the show running. If you're looking for other easy and free ways to support the show, please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review over there. It's simple. It's easy. It only takes one to two minutes out of your day, and we truly appreciate it if you can leave some feedback for the show. If you'd like to reach out to the show, please shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. That's it for this week's episode. Thank you again to The Great Courses and Igloo for sponsoring the show. We've got some great stuff coming up soon, and we will see you all next week. Next week.